Good morning and welcome to this morning's service. Are there any visitors? <coughs> well, we. Oh, from where? You're in the right spot. <laughs> anyway, as a reminder, oh, yes, another visitor. Welcome. Um, as a reminder, coffee is going to be served. It's October, and so there will be coffee um, in the Thorburn Hall. So we welcome you all to join in. Alistair is away at Presbytery, and he's returning this week. And so um, we have David Thompson and myself leading the service this morning. The Roses announce two births. The first rose announces the birth of Charlotte Millie Crace, granddaughter to David and Laura Jen Jennings. And so we celebrate with joy their happy news. And the second rose, also for the choir, um, the second rose announces the birth of Eleanor Rose Ganley, daughter of Dan and Jennifer Ganley. So we do celebrate this happy news with them all. And more happy news, the celebration of Doug and Maria's um, son, Andrew, to Nicole on Friday on Great Bay. And you'll be thankful to hear that the sun did shine by then, by five o'clock. <laughs> So, anyway, um, in your insert, you'll see announcement about Messy Church. Um, fabulous Friday follows the following week, and so please include that in your plans. And I think finally David reminded me that Monday, Canadians celebrate Thanksgiving, so happy Thanksgiving. Um, to those that celebrate. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. And now we'll sing hymn 198, let us build a church where love can dwell.
Let us pray. Lord God, you are the creator. You spoke and brought all things into existence. You also made each and every one of us, creating us uniquely. Thank you for all the different gifts you have given us so we can all play a part in the building of your church as the body of Christ, where all are welcome. You are sovereign God. You know all things from beginning to the end. You hold us in your hands, and because of that, we can take comfort knowing you will always be with us. Thank you, Lord, that we can trust in you. This morning, we come before you in the stillness of the sanctuary and in the quiet of our thoughts. The psalmist wrote, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You are familiar with all of my ways. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. So before you now, Lord, we acknowledge how far we have fallen short. Through our actions, or failure to act, for careless words and words left unspoken. Father, forgive us and help us to turn back to you, seeking your grace and forgiveness. We also ask for the patience and forgiveness of others as we work to restore relationships. Through your son, Jesus, we claim the assurance of your pardon and call on your spirit to work anew within us. Father God, strengthen and guide us in becoming more worthy servants, loving you and following you more nearly day by day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now we have a few children here. Would they like to come up to the front? Anybody? Well, we can talk from here. <laughs> Guys want to come up? <laughs> Thanks. So, just want to mention who is Jesus. So, if I do this, what do you think that is? A heart. A heart, absolutely. And what do you think a heart represents? Jesus. Jesus. And it represents love. And Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. And that's how he, how he wants to send his message to all of you, to the children, to the adults, to everybody in this church. So we're doing a little plug for next Saturday. <clears throat> so I hope you guys can attend. It's not only the children, it's adults. Grandpas, grandmas, visitors, everybody's welcome. We provide food, it's a fun time. Bring your favorite toys, bring your coloring books, everything that you enjoy, and come and join us for Saturday. Let me have a quick blessing for the children before they go to CCY. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for all who have taught us that Jesus loves us and indeed loves all the children of the world. Help us to share the future generations. This is the good news. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, have fun. Okay, we now 
Sing hymn 547, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Our first reading is taken from Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, reading from verses 13 to 31. You can find it on page 46 of the New Testament section of the Bible in the pews. This is the word of God. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. 
Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Our second reading is taken from Hebrews chapter 4, reading from verses 12 to 16, and that can be found on page 220, the New Testament section. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Thanks be to God. We shall sing together in 506, All I Once Held Dear. May the words from my mouth and the reflections in my heart be acceptable to you, my Lord, my rock, my redeemer. Amen. So it's been another week of major events. 
Hurricane Milton's visit to Florida and, and the disaster there, the conflicts in the Middle East escalating, Ukraine continues. But there's also been a week designated by the United Nations to challenge poverty. And in fact, on October the 7th is the United Nations Day for the Eradication of Poverty. The church is on the frontier between the kingdom of God and the evil of poverty, injustice, violence, addiction, broken relationships, and loneliness. It is there that we will meet Jesus. To the readings, we, we start off with Mark 10, Jesus blessing children and the rebuke from his disciples. Jesus was indignant and told the disciples that everyone who enters the kingdom of God is like a child will be received. The kingdom of God receives those who are like children. Then the story continues of the wealthy young man who approaches Jesus and asks what he needs to do to inherit eternal life. Jesus answers, if the man followed the Ten Commandments, which he goes on to summarize, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not uh, love your neighbor, as, thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself, etc. The man replies to confirm, he's followed all these commandments since a child. Jesus explains what is getting in the way of the man achieving eternal life. He goes on, he says, sell your possessions, give the money to the poor, and you can follow me. Now this man was very wealthy, and unfortunately this was a price he was not willing to pay. So he turned despondent and left. Jesus knew the man better than he knew himself. He knew there was something more important than seeking eternal life, which he could not fulfill. He had in fact broken two of the commandments, being love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. Clearly the man was holding back. <clears throat> the second commandment was not to make idols, but this man made an idol of his wealth and could not bring himself to give it all away. But we must not think only about money. Jesus saw, through, saw right through the young man's heart. And he can see through all our hearts. In verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. The second reading from Hebrews. At least some Christians think of corporate worship as relatively sedate. I suspect that worship services leave most of us feeling safe. However, in a book, Teaching a Stone to Talk by Annie Dillard, she writes about the dangers of meeting God in church. She compares worship to children playing on the floor with their chemistry sets, mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday. It is madness for wear ladies to wear straw hats and velvet to church, writes Dillard. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to the pews. For the sleeping God may wake someday and take offense, or the waiting God may draw us out of where we can never return. Most of us proclaim Hebrews 4 was also taught to think of reading God's word, not as children playing with TNT, but as a blessing. It is, after all, our only infallible rule for faith and life that comforts and strengths, strengthens as well as blesses and encourages us. We think of reading, studying, and meditating on the scriptures as one by means by which we open ourselves to God, gently preparing us to love God above all and our neighbors as ourselves. So when God's beloved children open God's word for devotions, few of us buckle on our crash helmets. When we open God's word during our services, we don't pull on our life preservers or fasten our seatbelts. God's word to us is, after all, like a balm in the Gilead, rather than a boat ride in a storm. Jesus is described as our great high priest. In those days, the duty of the priests were to offer sacrifices and pray for the people. Chosen from all the priests is one person selected as high priest. This high priest could enter the presence of God in the temple and only once per year. The role of high priest was to bring the voice of God to the people and to bring the failings and concerns of people into the presence of God. The high priest therefore had to be completely associated with God and completely associated with people. 
However, Jesus has ascended to heaven, so early Christians were concerned about what happens now. Who will offer sacrifices for us? Who will take our concerns to God? The writer of Hebrews provides answers that are relevant and good news for us today. <clears throat> In verse 14, the author seeks to answer those concerns by giving them the good news that not only will the ascended Jesus perform the role of high priest, but he will also be a great high priest for us. In fact, the verse establishes that Jesus is not in the presence of God one day a year, but always in the presence of God. Having established that we have a great high priest who is completely identified with God, we go on to see that Jesus is completely identified with us as well. When we bring our prayers to Jesus, he is able to empathize with the situations we bring because he has been tempted every way we have and without sin. However, it is extraordinary that Jesus being tempted every way without sin means that he never once gave in to temptation. <clears throat> we would fall into temptation long before that stage was ever reached. If you think of this like pain, there is a degree of pain that a human can withstand. And when that degree of pain is surpassed, we would all in likelihood lose consciousness. Our bodies would not be able to comprehend more pain. So as for temptation, we would not be able to comprehend temptations beyond our limits. So when we pray to Jesus, we are praying to the great high priest who knows each of the temptations that we have given into and that caused us to sin. We had hoped we might slip by with a few devout words about the white lives we've told or the gossip we've spread this week. You and I assume no one would ever know about our sinful thoughts and attitudes. God exposes that we thought and we could keep hidden from each other and perhaps even God. Even those who proclaim Hebrews 4 probably know what it's like to go to church hoping for a quiet hour but experiencing a loud word of condemnation. Yet when God's people encounter God's word, it has an amazing way of exposing even those private sins. It ruthlessly exposes the wrongs we thought we could keep hidden. And it leaves us feeling very vulnerable, helpless and defenseless before God's word. God's word sometimes makes God's adopted children want to scramble and find somewhere to hide. But the Hebrews author insists, no place to hide exists. God's word is, after all, sharper than any double-edged sword. It is so sharp that it even exposes sins about those which we've forgotten about or weren't even conscious. Yet while God's people can't hide any of those sins from God, while God's word often leaves us feeling vulnerable, God remains amazingly merciful. Though God knows about and exposes even the sins we keep hidden from each other, Hebrews reminds us it is God's remaining stunning gracious. So we know after all we must confess our sins to God. However, we also know that for Jesus' sake, God longs to show us God's amazing grace. On top of all that, God knows that the ascended Christ, the Son of God, somehow intercedes to us before his and our Father. In a way we can't fully comprehend Hebrews 4, it invites us to imagine that each time God's children sin, the ascended Christ steps in before the Father and says something like, remember that this is for the one whom I lived, died, rose again from the dead. Forgive him for my sake. Imagine one Sunday morning, three new people come into our church. We're not picking names. <laughs> I'm sure we'd get all excited to see new faces attending a church. And let's look at these people. One of these people is a wealthy young man with a concern for eternal life. The next person is a lady with a questionable reputation whom generally, people generally try to avoid. And the third person, we'll call him Zacchaeus, works in finance and there are rumors that he might even be crooked. So of these three people, which one would you like to most meet in the, in the church? <clears throat> In all honesty, we'd probably choose the wealthy young man. He has potential, could be a very beneficial to the church. However, 
The lady with the suspect reputation went away after her encounter with Jesus and became a successful evangelist in her neighborhood. If you look at John 4, verses 1 for 42. Zacchaeus left his encounter as a changed man. Read Luke 19, 1 through 10. However, the wealthy young man was the only one sad following his encounter with Jesus. Jesus loved each one of these three people equally and his love for them all, he sent two away happy and one feeling sad. Why would it be loving to send us away feeling sad? On the surface, the answer is wealth, but really it's much deeper. Having wealth is a powerful thing as it opens many doors in life. However, money cannot open the door to the most valuable thing of all, the kingdom of God. Sometimes money can be an impediment. The passage is so much more than simply money. It is about Jesus loving us and putting his finger upon whatever it is that we prioritize above God. So where do we all fit into this? Where do we see our church? I personally see our church not as a place to come on Sundays and just attend a worship. It's a community, that a family that attracts people from all walks of life. It's a community of spirits that manifests itself in the programs that we run, the outreach, the laundry, the feeding programs. I invite all of you to come and, and bear witness on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday or Saturday morning and see for yourself the large number of people from the community that come to our church to share what we have to offer. They receive food, laundry, shower facilities. As I said in the beginning, the church is on the frontier between the kingdom of God and the evil of poverty, injustice, violence, addiction, broken relationships and loneliness. This is the church I want to be part of. Amen. We should now sing hymn 557, A Love That Will Not Let Me Go. Let us pray. 
gracious and loving God, the source of all blessings and the provider of every good thing. Our hearts are full of gratitude. We lift our voices in thanksgiving for your unfailing love and faithful presence. O oh, love that wilt not let us go. In times of trial and uncertainty, your love sustains us and your promises give us strength and hope. Thank you for giving us your word as a guide to your truth, as well as to penetrate the depths of who we are with the power to transform us from the inside out. Above all, we give thanks for your son, Jesus Christ, and for the unsurpassed value of knowing him. God of justice and peace, we despair that in today's society, people are not all treated equally, and that further inequities reduce the dignity of your children. Your love does not discriminate. We pray for the church, empower it to expand its borders to reach those in need with compassion and practical support. Remind us that our ministry is not limited to one day of the week, nor within our walls. Strengthen the bounds of love and fellowship among us, that we may be a united witness to your love and grace. The needs and wants of the world and our community can seem overwhelming, but remind us that peace, restoring dignity, ending poverty, is the aim of your kingdom here on earth. Challenge each one of us to do our part as your children. We pray for leaders in government, in our community, and in the wider world. Grant them wisdom to use their power and influence to advance justice and restore peace. Before you now, we bring names of those who are heavy in our hearts this morning. We remember those who mourn a recent loss or who live in the shadow of loss. Remind them of your comforting presence. We lift up those recovering from surgery, those facing treatments or awaiting results, those understandably fearful about health issues. We ask for healing and your peace. We remember in prayer those, the families, too, and caregivers. Strengthen and sustain them. And as we face challenges in the coming weeks, through the power of your spirit, inspire us to approach you, to experience the fullness of your love and grace in our time of need. In your compassion, hear our prayers, for that we ask them in faith, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We will now receive the offering.
Let us pray. Accept, O Lord, these gifts which we now lay before you. May we see them as tokens of our willingness to give ourselves in being your disciples. This we ask in the name of the greatest gift of all, Jesus Christ our Lord. And we now repeat the words he taught us. Our Father, God in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So following the service, there will be refreshments out of the, uh, by the Thorburn Hall and we encourage you to join us. So our final hymn will be 419, Thine Be the Glory. Bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. <laughs> 